Hello and welcome to another edition of On the Road with Legal Talk Network. This is Lawrence Kaledium, the host for today's show, which is being recorded on location at the 2019 ABA Annual Meeting from San Francisco, the city where people wear flowers in their hair. So I have a couple of guests joining me, uh, fresh from the CLA and the City Series here. Their, uh, their topic was titled, their, their uh, session was titled, What Every Lawyer Should Know About Workplace Laws Protecting Victims of Domestic and Sexual Violence. So I want to welcome to the show, uh, Protima Pandy. Did I get yes, your last name correct? That's right. And Jennifer Rice. Did I get your name correct? Yes, you did. Well, ladies, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. I know it's a really busy time here at the ABA. There's a lot to see and do, and San Francisco is one of my favorite cities. I'm going to keep saying that every one of these recordings. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I wanted to, uh, before we get started uh, into the meat of the discussion here, I wanted to um, just ask you where you work, what do you do? So if you tell us about your bios, and Protima, can we start with you? Yes, thank you for having us. I'm, I'm so excited that we can share what we did this morning with the rest of our team. My name is Protima Pandey, and I'm the director for the Office of Women's Policy, which is part of the Division of Equity and Social Justice at the Santa Clara County. I work for the Santa Clara County CEO and the CEO's administrative body that makes policies and programming. Our office focuses on gender equity in programming, policymaking, and budget. And as part of the work that we do, Gender-based violence and economic advancement both cross over into the discussions that we had this morning. Prior to taking on this role, I was the managing attorney and immigration regional counsel for Bay Area Legal Aid and a former commissioner for the ABA Commission on domestic and sexual violence. And that's why I'm very excited that we're here today. Thank you. A lot of expertise there. Uh, And Jennifer. Hi, I'm really pleased to be here as well. Um, My name is Jennifer Reich. I'm the legal director for Equal Rights Advocates. Uh, We are a nonprofit civil rights advocacy organization based in San Francisco. We do work nationally to advance access and opportunities for women and girls in education and employment. I come from a background of uh, worker employment related litigation. I've been representing uh, mostly low paid and a lot of immigrant workers um, in employment matters, including sexual harassment, sexual assault cases uh, for over 15 years. And ERA, as an organization, provides uh, free legal services uh, through our advice and counseling program, as well as we engage in litigation and policy advocacy on behalf of victims of sexual harassment and violence. Um, So I'm very pleased to be here as well. So let's turn to our main topic. You all were presenting at the the Seal in the City session titled, What Every Lawyer Should Know About Workplace Laws Protecting Victims of Domestic and Sexual Violence. And of course, this was uh, sponsored by the ABA Center for Public Interest Law and the ABA Commission on Domestic and Sexual Violence. Uh, and so anyway, if you could help me out, you know, I understand there's a lot of topics that came up, but if you give me the 50,000 foot, that'd be very helpful. So uh, who wants to volunteer? I'll go ahead. Thank you very much, Lawrence, for having us this morning. Our plan was to make sure that we have a cross-section of uh, information as well as legal resources for both employers and employees. And we were presenting a perspective that allows and empowers those in the room with ways in which workplaces are set up to ensure that workplace violence is addressed with also the ways that we as lawyers need to ensure that workplaces respond to gender-based violence, that they don't just check a compliance box, but create competencies within the workplace that help every individual who shows up to work to thrive and bring their best skills to work, not have to worry about failing in their job because they're being victimized at their workplace. Yeah, and it's important to keep in mind, we definitely, um, our focus was on, I think one of our emphases was that we really need to take a prevention focused approach to these issues, Um, whether you're talking about sexual harassment, which can also also lead to uh, sexual violence in the workplace, or you're talking about domestic and intimate partner violence that is taking place in uh, employees' lives outside of work, but which often bleeds into the workplace. 
taking a prevention and intervention approach is really critical. Um, and recognizing that domestic and sexual violence are really pervasive problems. They, they impact uh, millions of workers in this country uh, every day, every year. Um, just to throw a few stats out at you, um, there are surveys that show that more than 44% of working U.S. adults mm -hmm. report that they've experienced the effects of domestic violence in the workplace. Um, and of women who are experiencing intimate partner domestic violence, uh, anywhere from 60 to 88 percent of them will experience that abuse uh, at work, either in person or over the telephone. Um, and r keeping in mind that, you know, one out of every three American women have reported being the victim of physical abuse by an intimate partner at some point in their lives. So, um, you know, this is a large, these are significant problems. Um, they are not just personal or private mm -hmm. matters. Mm -hmm. They really can have an impact on people's ability to uh, keep a job, to, to be productive in their jobs. Um, and it can also have an impact on the safety and well-being of of their coworkers, um, you know, unfortunately, when we talk about gun violence and we talk about um, stalking, these are things where, where oftentimes these these things that we may want to think about as private matters really come into the workplace, and really employers have to take a very proactive approach to, um, as Protima said, to making sure that their workplaces are safe and equitable and places where each individual can thrive. And to add to the statistic that Jennifer was just sharing, CDC has tabbed that all lost productivity because of workplace violence adds up to $727 million annually. And I believe this number is going to just keep going up. So this is not something that we have to take lightly. It does impact bottom lines. So uh, I think a good transition point there, I mean, that, that is uh, quite a figure. And so it's a nice lead into my next question. So, you know, workplace employers, you know, how, how you know, in terms of, you know, victims of domestic and sexual violence, uh, you know, obviously a very personal issue, but uh, connect the dots to me to the employer, you know, who is a nice person that employs people and they've got wonderful people that work for them. How, how, what, how does this affect them and what, what do they need to be looking for? Well, it it affects it, it affects costs and productivity, um, but it also can affect um, you know in in many different ways. Um, but it also by by affecting workers' safety and and well being, it is a real drain on employee uh, morale. On it can affect turnover, um, and it also is it can present a barrier to economic security that is particularly uh, harmful to women um, because as as, as the statistics, of course, show, um, you know, 85% or more of the victims of, of domestic and sexual violence are women. Um, and, and so if you're talking about creating an equitable workplace, if you're talking about promoting diversity and equity and inclusion in your workplace, then you need to make sure that you have uh, policies on gender-based violence that are effective and comprehensive and that actually, um, you know, encompass uh, these issues. Um, because, in fact, over two-thirds of employers don't have any formal policies in place at all to address domestic violence or other violence in the workplace. And so, as a result, a lot of employers' first reaction is to penalize the victim. As an example, you know, if you are an employer and you are noticing that, you know, Sherry, to give her name, um, you know, has a partner who keeps um, stalking her, coming to the parking lot, um, waiting for her outside the, the office, um, and is really making both, you know, perhaps uh, her and her coworkers uncomfortable. Um, and you're concerned uh, about, about this guy, you know, doing something that's going to threaten the well-being of Sherry or of her coworkers, um, you know, your instinct might be, okay, well, we have a problem, and the problem is Sherry's boyfriend, so we're going to fire Sherry. Um, or we're going to get rid of Sherry in some way. And, and that is, you know, unfortunately, not necessarily illegal in a lot of states. Um, to it, it, many, Only very few states actually have specific laws barring discrimination on the basis of being a victim of, of domestic or sexual violence. Um, but... But the reaction that, that most employers uh, may instinctively have is really not going to, um, is not only not going to solve the problem long term, but it's also going to um, create enormous, um, you know, 
terrible consequences for the, the, the people who are suffering the abuse. Um, so it's really important to, again, take a prevention and supportive approach to recognize the, the problem and to offer this, the, the victim or survivor um, you know, options and information and to offer support. Uh, and, 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 and in that way, you know, let that employee know that she is really valued and that, um, and that you know, her safety is in fact as important as, as the safety of others. And if we were to just add to that, let's think about Yolanda who works in the office and has a coworker who's harassing her, right? A similar problem, but in the context of sexual harassment at work, we're talking about Yolanda now requiring that her workplace respect the fact that her physical autonomy and her ability to work is being compromised. What is the first thing that most employers do? To go back to what Jennifer was saying, we'll change Yolanda's shift so Yolanda doesn't have to work with Amy who's sexually harassing her. Well, we're now talking about penalizing. Who did we penalize? We penalized Yolanda. Why did we penalize her? We penalized her for speaking up. We shouldn't be a country where our workers have to choose between losing their job and pay, not being able to pay rent or showing up to work every day and suffering indignities and suffering what is criminal behavior. Mm. We at the workplace must ensure that the Yolandas and the Sherrys, and this is, you know, a disproportionately large number of victims of gender-based violence are women and trans women, but we must remember this is not a problem that only impacts you if you're a woman or a trans woman. This is a problem that is pervasive. And within the workplace, you're absolutely right. A good employer and a good employee, they should be able to have a symbiotic relationship where the employer says, I'm hiring you for your skills. I'm hiring you for your intellect. I will ensure that you're set up to thrive. That's what we should strive towards. Yeah. yeah coincidentally enough, uh, on my way over here, I was on my way to the airport, uh, my Uber driver and I were chatting about uh, this. And apparently uh, this, this came up with his uh, daughter at a church event. And so his daughter is an adult, but, uh, it, you know, so uh, not that that makes a difference, but, you know, just so people don't overly yeah. react, uh, you know, she was an adult, she handled it, but they decided at that point going forward with these church functions to have uh, HR training. And so we were chatting mm -hmm. about that. And so, um, you know, handbooks out there an active mm -hmm. HR policy, you know, getting in front of these issues before they happen saying, Hey, this is acceptable behavior. This is not acceptable behavior. And, right. you know, and I think some of it too, I think is important because, you know, people meet each other, uh, in relationships at work, whether friends and sometimes more than friends, uh, mm -hmm. that, the workplace, you have common interests, you know, chances are gravity of people being who they are, are going to find people that are attracted to, but there's an acceptable way to go about that, an unacceptable way to do it. And so uh, how much of a believer are you in good HR policies and getting in front of that and, and training as preventing some of these issues before they happen? Well, I think policies and training are both key, but they have to be effective, right? right. And so a, an effective uh, gender-based violence and sexual harassment policy really has to be inclusive of all the different forms of gender-based violence and harassment. It has to cover all the different kinds of relationships that exist um, in the workplace or workplace environment. And that includes not just relationships among employees or between employees and supervisors, but you also have to think about, well, what about relationships that are employees have with contractors and vendors um, or with clients um, That's a good point. you know and and what are the processes for reporting or investigating um, these kinds of uh, issues and incidents and what are the consequences for violating the policy and are they really clearly defined and and the, the policy itself, as we were pointing out at our panel earlier, it has to be written in language that the right. employees actually right. understand so Absolutely, right. with all great respect for my fellow lawyers and I, you know, we have a tendency to hmm. use too many words and to big use words. big yes. words and <laughs> here to fours and, and to define, you know, uh, problems in terms of in legal terms and using legal phraseology that you know frankly everyone else is like but what does that mean it's like a circular definition you have to give 
use real live examples. You know, don't be afraid to like have a section of your policy manual that actually gives a little tiny little hypothetical um, that that is based in a situation that really could arise in the kind of workplaces where your employees work. You know, if you if you run a bunch of coffee shops, well then talk about an interaction that might happen between a customer and a barista. You know, don't talk about something that might happen at a at an office in you know whatever if you don't have if you don't employ a bunch of office employees. If 80% of your workforce is Spanish speaking, consider getting your policy translated. And then of course make sure that it actually gets into the hands and minds of your employees. It is absolutely useless to everyone if it is buried on page 23 of a 47 page personnel policy that someone is handed only once at the time of their hire and then never told about again. Um, so consider all those things. And then when it comes to education and training, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, training not being effective and training actually making the problem worse. And actually there is some evidence to show that if the trainings are done wrong, they really can be um, negative. They can have a negative impact. Um, and most of the training around sexual harassment um, prevention over the past 15 years or so has been very compliance focused, as Protima alluded to earlier. It's been run by lawyers, and frankly, it's been run by lawyers for lawyers, right? <laughs> because it's almost designed yeah. Yeah. to sort of force um, people running businesses and other kinds of organizations to have to rely on legal counsel. Right. Um, but really, what you want to do is you want to educate uh, employees at all different levels of your organization around these issues in terms of equity and respect and, right. and safety. And you want to build common understanding through dialogue. So the trainings should be interactive. Like there, every adult education you know, study ever done will show that people learn when they do stuff, when they talk, when they get a chance to engage with the material. So don't just have people sit there and watch a video and then check a box. You know, in, make people have discussions, you know, make people talk about this stuff. Um, and then provide them with real resources and referrals. Engage with community organizations in your area to, if you don't know how to talk about sexual violence and what it means and what it doesn't mean, then bring in a community organization that does it all the time to help you help your employees do a better job. And for me, one thing I will say, HR policies, when was the last time you looked at your packet that you got when you got hired? Okay. It's been a while. Don't, yeah, <laughs> I was about to say, don't answer that for you guys. <laughs> but the bottom line is, we are, are, we are talking about an issue that impacts me as a human being. An issue where if I have called you as my HR representative about my benefits, if I've called you about my paycheck, if I've called you about my insurance, I sure as heck I'm not sure what to tell you when it comes to interpersonal violence. Whether I'm suffering that violence at the hands of an intimate partner, whether I'm being sexually abused and assaulted and harassed, I don't know where to begin. And that's where mm. the, the point that Jennifer was talking about in terms of training, training can check a box, but training that's competent training talks about trauma-informed and victim-centered. Understanding, maybe, maybe allocating one or two human resource representatives to get trained in working on issues that, that relate to domestic or sexual violence. This is the expert. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry you have to go through this. Thank you very much for calling us. May I ask what's a good time? What's a good place? I may come to you and talk to you and there are five other people in, in cubicles right next to you. You think I'm going to tell you about having been sexually assaulted by my boss? Think again, Lawrence. And we have, to, we have to make sure that we are telling people these are realities of people's lives. And if you want to make sure that this individual is set up to survive in, and thrive in the work, workplace, then remember different issues that they bring to you require different approaches. There's a lot here, and uh, you know, obviously, we have limited time. So what I want to do is just get into specifics in it. So I know, you know, the title is "What Every Lawyer Should Know About Workplace Laws Protecting Victims of Domestic and Sexual Violence." Uh, but you know, I, I look at this as not just a lawyer issue, but an employer issue, but also an employee issue. And so I'm wondering, I'd like to turn to each of you on this. You know, what are some good resources for? all three of those folks, uh, the, the, the lawyer, the employer, the employee to turn to, to get more information about this. So the ABA has a model policy that 
people can access from the ABA Commission on, the, on Domestic and Sexual Violence. That's a policy that an HR individual or a lawyer can look at in order to understand how to adopt that in their workplace. For workers that are organizations like Jennifer's, and I will let Jennifer talk about the workers piece. The only other piece that I do want to highlight is that this is something that we need to remember. The empowerment has to happen at both ends. The tone that is set at your workplace in terms of whether this is acceptable behavior or not, this is conduct that's not tolerated, here's what we do about it, that tone has to be explicitly said so that nobody feels fearful of being able to keep their job and report that there is unlawful conduct going on. And for workers, I'll turn it to Jennifer. Yeah, well, actually, for workers as well as for employers and advocates, um, there is a wonderful resource uh, called uh, workplacesrespond.org, which is uh, curated by a, an organization called Futures Without Violence. Um, but the Workplaces Respond to Domestic and Sexual Violence uh, National Resource Center has all kinds of tools for managers, for employers, for uh, folks who are representing victims and survivors, and for the victims and survivors and coworkers themselves. Um, you know, some of those things include, for example, a safety card that you can print out um, that uh, you know you can you can post on your on your uh, in your. Common, break, Ca area. common break area or, or lunchroom. Um, mm -hmm. There are national hotlines and resources, um, the, the National Domestic Violence Hotline, uh, as well as the um, hotline run by RAIN, which is, stands for Rape, Abuse, Incest National Networks. Um, and that, that hotline can help connect you to local rape crisis centers. Um, and all of those uh, organizations uh, that I, are, are also ways that you can connect, uh, whether you're an employee or an employer or you're somewhere in between, <laughs> um, and you're trying to figure out you know, not only how to put the right policies in place, but then where are places in my community where I can get access to this kind of training that I need to understand this issue and how we should deal with it. Um, you know, there are organizations that provide that kind of training. Um, and my organization, Equal Rights Advocates, we have Know Your Rights materials about sexual harassment at work um, on our website, which is equalrights.org. Um, and, you know, I, again, want to repeat that uh, at workplacesrespond.org, you will find just a plethora of materials, whether you're an advocate, a union, um, an employer, or a survivor, or a friend of a survivor. So I would definitely look there for, for more information. Well, it looks like we've reached the end of the road for our episode here today. And I want to thank our guests for joining us, Jennifer and Protima. Thank you so much, ladies, for joining us. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. And if our listeners, they have questions or they wish to follow up with you, how can they find you? So I am at protima.pande at ceo.sccgov.org or look up the County of Santa Clara Office of Women's Policy. Our website has many resources and we also have social media presence. Yes, and I am available at, uh, through email at jreich, J-R-E-I-S-C-H, at equalrights.org, and that is also our website, equalrights, all one word, dot O-R-G, and um, that is the best place to find me. Excellent. Well, I also want to thank our listeners for tuning in. And ladies, again, thank you for joining us. And listeners, if you enjoyed what you heard, please rate and review us in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or best yet, your favorite podcasting app. I'm Lawrence Coletti. Until next time, thank you for listening. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. Find us on Twitter and Facebook. Or download our free Legal Talk Network app in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.